um, like you mentioned, my name is Frank Garcia. I studied mechanical engineering here, uh, 2019 graduated. So this, that building over here, they were telling me where to park, like at the BSB. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, is that the new building? And I guess it was, but um, for me, it's new. So it's cool to see the school like continuing to grow. Um, so I was normally, I guess you guys have like some presentations and stuff, but I kind of wanted to just be like an open book. I figured like, um, so going back, I was working at HEB uh, as an engineer there um, for like a year or two or so. And then for whatever reason, um, my dad had this like crazy idea of starting this like machine shop that was going to be this futuristic advanced manufacturing facility. And uh, I didn't even work on it. I was still at HEB. He was like, hey, do you know anybody who's graduated, who's like really cool, fits well with us? Yeah. So I introduced him to my friend named Alex, who was one of my best friends um, in college at the time. I still talk to him every day. Um, so them two pretty much started our whole, that, that whole company. Um, we had 23 slash 24 year old Alex, our quality manager. He was in charge of actually getting our quality management system, QMS, um, in aerospace and defense. That is called an AS9100 certification, which is one of the toughest certifications you can get. So we had this 24 year old and then we had my dad who had probably been in like two machine shops his entire life. He has a background in mechanical engineering. He worked at Boeing, General Dynamics, Sikorsky, uh, worked on the F-22, Marine One, like all, like crazy amount of experience, right? Uh, so here I was coming out of college, working at HEB, only had experience in like groceries and food and all that. And um, kind of saw that they were having fun doing this, this thing, starting aerospace and defense. So I was like, Kind of like that that cat meme looking over the snow like what are y'all doing over there i want to go go try it out uh so i did that and so th this is one of the coolest things and i know dr Cone or dr appleford too was in a meeting with a ut uh, professor and somebody else in charge of a contract i think we we're working on getting and i told them this story about how prevalent utsa is in the space industry and i had no idea uh so our very first project we got, I was kind of in charge of getting work and business development, which was not something I was used to at all. My background was engineering. I like to stay in my little area. Nobody bother me. Like, just feed me Red Bull and that's it, right? I'll do my thing. Um, started doing business development, got into the space industry, and it was, it was awesome, right? So we first started talking to this company called Nanorax. Nanorax is a company, if you haven't heard of them, they're probably one of the truest commercial space companies out there right now. Um, and what they do is they take your payload. UTSA may have worked with them before or not. I don't know. They take your payload and basically handle the entire logistics, the engineering, uh, the manufacturing, and get your part to space, right? They, they do the logistics. They say, okay, here's your payload. It's going to work. Um, we're going to get you on this SpaceX rocket, and it's going to launch here, and then your return date is this, whatever. They handle everything. Um, that was the first time I, I really, like, got into the space industry. And so the engineer, the engineering manager over there, his name was Joe. He turns out to be a UTSA grad who graduated a few years before me. He was in a fraternity as well, kind of reminisced a little bit, had some horror stories, um, but hit it off. We ended up doing this huge project for them, right? We manufactured what they were engineering. So you had this engineering manager who was essentially designing the whole thing, right? And then you had the manufacturing managers, which were also UTSA grads. But above that, you also had another UTSA grad who was working at NASA, who was actually in charge of validating all their designs and testing and everything. So from the entire value stream map, you had UTSA runner, road runners the whole way. At the end of it, uh, we launched this payload and it turns out it was like, the I didn't know it at the time, it was the first virtual reality camera in space. And so it's on the ISS right now. That was like the cool story that was like, okay, we're definitely getting it in space. So groceries is cool. Love HEV. Definitely recommend working there. But space is pretty cool, especially in my 20s. Like, you know, why not? Um, so that's kind of how Landero got into space, right? We started as a manufacturing company. Uh, we worked, grinded our teeth in industrial gas turbines, which is like the worst disgusting material that you can possibly work with. Um, if you've heard of high temp nickel or cobalt based alloys. Those are like super materials that can handle extreme heat. Um, they have extreme wear resistance, right? 
So if you heard of Inconel or Hain 6 L605, Monel, um, these are all these like crazy alien high temp alloys that you're like, I have no idea how it works, but it does, it's pretty cool. We machined and manufactured a lot of stuff for that, got into space, found our niche there, get our, did our AS9100 certification. Um, but the reason I give you that background is kind of so you understand the process a little bit of manufacturing. Um, when I was in engineering, like I tried to test out of the SOLIDWORKS class because I had that in high school and I was like, I did this, I know how to do this. Whatever reason, UTSA just did not let me. So I had to take it and I did all the little models and everything. Um, that is a whole different animal compared to manufacturing. Okay, so if you want your tail between your legs, try manufacturing. Um, if you want to feel really useless, start a business out of it. It is extremely humbling. Uh, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, so engineers have like CAD, right? You have this SOLIDWORKS magic. It's like you design it on CAD and it's like perfect. It handles all your FEA tests, your thermal properties, your stress properties, goes through all your cycles. Everything looks blue and it's nice and it works, right? Factor of safety is off the charts. Take that design and try to manufacture it. And I guarantee you will rethink your entire life. You'll be like, I don't know why I designed it like this, but now I understand I have to design for manufacturability. Otherwise, it's just nice little picture art, nothing more. It will never be a real thing. Um, so I had a great appreciation for manufacturing after we started this. I wish that is something more that universities taught. Um, I didn't even really know what a CNC machine was and I had already graduated. Like I knew about it, but I didn't really put the pieces together until I actually used one. Um, so that's the manufacturing process, right? And where am I going with this? In space manufacturing is drawing upon existing technologies to, to, to basically do everything in space, right? So you have different types of manufacturing. You have CNC machining, you have uh, sheet metal forming, you have composites, you have uh, casting, you have forging, all this stuff. All of these different manufacturing processes have been validated and tested. And these are materials that you've been using for thousands of years, right? So like the aluminum forging, forging steel, cast iron, like all, all these materials have been validated. We know what material properties they have. We know what they do. Uh, in comes in, um, additive, right? In it, like this really new, sleek, cool, like 3D printing, this like you basically upload a CAD file to this machine and it'll print anything you want. Sounds amazing, right? Like I, I was talking to Dr. Combs, I was doing research in his, what, what is his lab now? Back then was drones and 3D printing. And back in 2014 or so, 2013, I was using 3D printers. It's come a long way since then. Uh, but I can tell you from experience, it has so much more to go before you can validate um, those materials for space flight hardware and lunar manufacturing and in-orbit manufacturing. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. The commercial space industry is drawing upon industry to say, hey, give me these solutions. Here's what we're trying to do. We want a base on the moon eventually. We want to sustain human presence in orbit, which sounds crazy, but it's it's like the next industry, it's gonna happen. Uh, so industry is coming up and they're saying, oh, well, advanced manufacturing, additive, 3D printing, uh, you can just upload a CAD file. You don't need like a crazy amount of robotics. Like it, it, it's perfect for this, right? So as an engineer, yes. Like in theory, yes, absolutely. That makes 100% sense. Um, with manufacturing experience, absolutely not. And here's why, which is kind of stark to say that, but here's why. I mentioned that we've been using these same materials for thousands of years. We know what they do. Our engineers design models. They design things for those materials. When you 3D print something, you're essentially taking a material and you're making it into a part, right? You're building layer upon layer or SLS. You're using a laser to, to center some powder and then you have some post processes or whatever. Every single one of those parts can print differently. Um, which lends itself to, I guess, maybe y'all's experiences, CAMI is validating and testing these things. Um, when, when we do manufacturing, there are some space flight hardware that even when we machine it with a tried and true practice, we still have to put it through non-destructive testing. 
So that includes x-ray, that includes FPI, um, fluorescent penetrant inspection. It includes ultrasonic testing, uh, mag particle. And essentially what this is testing for is impurities in the material itself or cracks or propagations that can happen when you launch in space and goes through these crazy thermal cycles and vibration can expand and you can have catastrophic failure. Um, CNC machining is much more reliable in that sense. When you print something, it is like every single part, every single time has to be tested because every single part can have different properties, even though you're using the same material. Um, that's why I say we have a long way to go in that. So kind of what, what we're coming up with, um, let me backtrack a little bit. Lander is a manufacturing company, advanced manufacturing. We focus on developing software, developing our own technology and leveraging existing processes like CNC machining. To, to make affordable, quick turnaround parts for the space industry. About two weeks or so ago, we got um, all of the things we needed essentially to bid on government contracts and engineering contracts. So to work with the government, you have to go through this slew of like check boxes. You have to do all these things, right? So we finally checked off our last check box on there. And there's a real, nothing keeping us from bidding on these, on these contracts from an engineering perspective. So we essentially cut the company in half. We have manufacturing on one side and we have engineering on the other. So I'm in charge of the manufacturing. My dad is actually doing the engineering since he's got like 30 years of experience doing that. Um, he built, he has a lot more rapport in his, in his uh, resume, I guess, if you will. So where where does that go like like that's such a broad range whenever i go to nasa they're like a machine shop that does engineering like they can't fathom like those are two completely different things you have machinists starting machine shops and you have engineers starting engineering companies well my dad's an engineer alex was an engineer i'm an engineer we were three blind mechanical engineers starting a machine shop which i do not recommend but we did it and we went about it from a from an engineering standpoint. We solved problems. We fixed the pothole that was in front of us so we didn't fall into it. We didn't like lay on the sky, lay on the ground and be like, oh, look at all these great ideas we can have. No, we have payroll. We have to make, we have to do these things. Um, from an engineering perspective, uh, it seems kind of crazy to propose anything not additive for in-space manufacturing, but that's where our experience comes in. As a machine shop, we know like we know how to make these parts, right? We we tested our processes, tested our systems. Our software is like not available in the market. We made our own software, um, so we know how to make these parts. The engineers that generally propose um, their ideas for these contracts are engineers, right? And they are more yes, the additive will work because it's nice, it's sleek, it's new. Uh, we come from a completely different perspective um, from manufacturing. That's where our company is kind of going. But that leads me into my next point of the whole commercial space industry and how it's kind of like the wild west right now. Uh, whenever I go to NASA and JSC in particular, I usually ask four or five different engineers like what the role of NASA is. And um, I get like seven or eight different answers. Um, so. <laughs> And the reason for that is because the commercial space industry is, is booming right now. It's like, it's the wild west. There's not really any like governance over it right now. It's like, if you want to launch something, you can launch it. There's nothing keeping you from doing that. Uh, so they have a very different role than, than they used to. You have companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Firefly, Ursa Major, that's 3D printing rocket engines. Stoke that's looking to reuse um, their, their own rockets, all of which are offering these launch services to allow anybody to access space, which is pretty cool. But why would, like, why would I even need to go, right? Like I can do everything here that I, I can do up there. Why do I need it? Um, I personally, I think like manufacturing and industrializing in orbit and on the lunar surface is like the sole reason to go. Not really the sole reason, but it's probably the biggest economic driver to go. Uh, any industry that eventually commercializes has to do it through technology. You look at agriculture in like the 1920s, 
that didn't really start booming until you started automating a lot of those processes. Um, but yeah, does anybody have any questions yet? I'm just kind of just kind of going on. Does anybody? You can feel free to stop me throughout throughout this thing and just be like, hey, you know, got a question. Okay, so cool. Um, but yeah, so that is kind of like where where the industry is and where it's going. You have a lot of companies that are also so like take Nanorec. Okay, actually, let me start by saying this. Has anybody ever thought of starting their own business ever? I got people looking around. Yes. Okay. I'm, I know there's more of you. I know everybody has thought about it. If you're an engineer, you've 100% thought about it. You can raise your hand. It's okay. I'm not going to grill you. Um, okay. Well, maybe y'all are smarter than I was. And <laughs> I definitely wouldn't recommend it. But if you do, if, if you do, um, the best advice I can give to you is even in your own career, if you don't start a company, develop a a set of business tools and have those business tools in your pocket and draw on them from experience. That is the best way you can possibly move up in your company or start a business, right? Again, going back to the in-space manufacturing, like you see companies developing a solution where there's no problem and it's just solutionism. It's like you're solving a problem that doesn't exist. So how are you going to commercialize that? You know, um, you always want to start start with your why. Like, why are you doing it? What is the problem and who is the customer? And you obsess on the customer. How does that translate to your career? Where it may not be your customer, it may be your boss. It may be your company's customer and you deliver for them. You always want to be thinking where you are in your value stream and develop a solution for your customer or better yet, for your customer's customer. That is how you can get anything you want in your career, anything you want in business. You always want to be looking kind of like a derivative ahead. Um, the reason I say that is because we, we've seen a lot of like solutionism, I guess, in the commercial space industry where people are just kind of coming up with something just to come up with something um, and it doesn't solve anything. And then those companies fail. And then it makes the commercial space industry look like it's just completely risky, which it is, it's very risky. But just as any business, you start something that doesn't have a true need, it will fail. You know? Uh, are there any any readers in here? Like anybody like to read? I'll be the first one to admit I don't like to read, but I do it sometimes. Um, there are a few books I definitely recommend if you want to learn more about possibly starting your own business or just good career advice. Uh, the first one I recommend is Start With Why. Um, that will kind of, that explains why some companies create a brand and some are just purely competing on a commodity and margins. You have companies like Southwest, um, Apple, um, Columbia, Patagonia, Disney that have these brands, right? And there, there's always a why that starts with that. They're never starting with the solution. They're always starting with why are we doing this and who is our customer and what do we want to offer to them? It's never, well, we have this cool technology. Let's try to figure out how we can use it. That's the backwards way of doing it. Um, the second one I would definitely recommend is... Uh, the Lean Startup, which is, is, especially if you're an engineer, it will absolutely, um, I guess, strike a chord with you. That is a business person who studied manufacturing and has kind of drawn upon engineering principles and created a business model out of it. Um, again, in, 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 the start, in the Lean Startup, what you want to do is you want to basically, it, it's, like a, it's like a circle. You build, you measure, and you learn. But whenever you start a company or whenever you start a business or anything, you always want to start with what you learn. What is it you want to learn? I come up with this hypothesis, right? Um, I think the space industry needs this advanced manufacturing company that can deliver extremely affordable parts extremely quickly um, with impeccable quality and give customers like an unbelievable customer experience so that their engineers can essentially have their own machine shop without having their own machine shop. That was my hypothesis, okay? So then I, I, I went in and said, how do I measure that? How do I measure this hypothesis that I want to learn and test? That is, that I personally did, and I absolutely recommend just jumping in. Go into every event you can possibly go to and talk to every person you can possibly talk to. Network. I have met so many people asking what I thought were stupid questions, and they turned out to open unbelievable doors for me. Um, 
So absolutely ask questions. I, I think roadrunners are kind of, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but we kind of have a chip on our shoulder. Like, you know, like we're just not just like scared of anything to so like go ask questions, go learn and go get your feet on the ground, close the textbook and go out there and go, go learn. Um, so that, that was my, that was how I wanted to learn essentially, I guess, or that, those aren't really quantitative metrics, but that was kind of like a qualitative validation that I was onto something. Um, and so what do we do? We built something. So with that somewhat validate, that validation, I wanted to test it. The thing that differentiates Landera the most so far, we, we buy the same Haas machines, right? We have, we have VF milling machines like everybody else does. Anybody with a garage can go buy it. I think we have some even in like the new manufacturing building, maybe if you haven't been there yet. Um, I heard there are milling machines there. Uh, we have the same processes, right? So like we standardize on these processes because they've been validated. And the quality management system, the QMS that I talked about has been validated. We know that if we follow these steps, any part I make will do well in space. I know any one of these parts will do well in an aerospace or defense uh, component or system. So how does, how does a company ever differentiate itself um, when, when you're just stuck to like these core things? I wanna ask, before I answer how we did it, um, how would anybody differentiate themselves in this industry when you're competing on margin, uh, when you're competing on costs and quality and lead time, the same thing everybody else competes on, especially with manufacturing, yes. Customer service? Yes, customer service is a big one, that is huge. Um, are there any other, any other, yeah. Advertising. What was that? Advertising. Advertising is a good one. That kind of lends itself into branding, right? Then that's, you're kind of selling your reputation and your brand. That's another good one. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Maybe a more technical approach. I've already said it. It's not like. Yeah. Yeah. So who are we serving? I guess like what, what we can possibly do with the parts that we're making. Yeah. Um, so, so let me tell you how we did it. And all those are correct. We've, we've done all of those things at some point or another, um, especially yours, customer satisfaction. So I thought, well, everybody's standard on it, standardizing on the same processes. Everybody's buying the same machines. If I wanted to make my own machine, we, it would probably take millions of dollars to do that. That's not an option. Um, so we turned to software. Um, and I, I definitely recommend any engineers in this room to research this because this will be our future way of doing our what we do. If you haven't heard of it already, um, research model-based definition, model-based systems engineering, and product manufacturing information. And you'll kind of get an idea of where this industry is going and where engineering is going. It's always been... Um, drawings right like we like why why do we make 3d models just to print 2d drawings with it it doesn't make any sense um why do we put 2d text on a 3d model it doesn't make any sense uh but that's that's kind of where things are going so managing technical documents and technical data as it's called the drawings your materials your part list that is by far the most important aspect of manufacturing anything critical is you have to you have to essentially keep track and audit every single step of your manufacturing process so that you know the material you get is exactly what the engineer wants it's coming from somewhere domestic uh, you have to make sure every single piece of hardware that goes on your whether it's an insert whether it's a screw um, a nut a bolt every single piece of hardware has to be certified okay um, you can imagine having dozens of these pieces of hardware, different part numbers. It gets really hard to track. Um, same thing with coding. Does anybody know anything about post-processing, um, like machine parts or just manufacturing at all about coatings? This is something you're going you're gonna to learn, um, especially if you're a design engineer. Every single part that comes out of our shop is, well, almost every single part is coded with something. So we have 
two main ones and I'll get to them later. We have anodized coatings and we have chemical conversion coating. I'll, I'll explain what they do later. But essentially we have to send our parts to these vendors that can do that. They send it back and they say, yes, it's, it performs and it meets your NASA-PRC-spec or whatever. Now think about keeping track of all of this. Every single, you have like thousands of data points for each part. We may have dozens, if not hundreds of parts in our machine shop at a certain time. So that is like quickly tens of thousands of data points that we have to keep track of. And if we don't and something goes wrong, it comes right back to us. Uh, so we developed our own software and we called it Stardust. So Stardust is essentially a way to manage all of our manufacturing data. And it's not something that's available on the market at all. Um, we've, we've tried to implement three or four different ERP systems and all of them suck. So we made our own and it kind of, it's not even an ERP anymore. Um, an ERP just kind of manages your materials and things like that. It's kind of morphed into its own thing. So it essentially talks to like four or five different softwares and it pulls together and keeps track of all those thousands of data points and it can automatically compile, compile all of our QA requirements for each job. Um, so going back to what you said, customer service, we're creating um, a customer facing portal, like I mentioned earlier, that engineers can essentially treat our own machine shop as their machine shop without having the overhead and having to keep ex like extremely skilled labor. They can look into our production at any given time they want and see exactly where their part is at any given time. Um, we also have a software that can extract features. So I mentioned product manufacturing information, model-based definition. Those are all new ways to do engineering where you're getting rid of drawings and you're essentially using the 3D model and putting all your manufacturing data in there so that you have one source of truth as opposed to maybe 10 or 11 different uh, documents that you have to keep track of. All these things feed into Stardust and essentially Stardust is now uh, managing all of our administrative tasks, all of our quality requirements, everything. Yes. So when you say 3D model, you mean a lead model, right? Yes, yes, like a CAD model, like you have a step file or um, use NX or if you use SolidWorks or Katia. Um, yeah, they all have their own 3D models. Uh, so yeah, we have like a like an AI software, which we didn't build, but essentially it goes into each model and it extracts features out of it. So it'll say, oh, you have 20 different holes of these different sizes. Um, and essentially it turns it into a machine readable format that Stardust can go in and say, okay, well now I need it. I know I need to order all these things. I need to order tooling for this. Um, so we don't have to do any of that. It is completely automated on its own. So can the customer customize the piece that they want? Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's a good question, actually. So I guess it, it helps to know like what it is exactly we machine. We don't make a lot of the parts. We don't design a lot of the parts that we machine. We take a customer data. We take their drawings. We take their models. And they say, hey, you guys need to figure out how to make this. And we figure out how to make it and give it back to them. Um, so that's what we do, um, all of which has to adhere to, to our specs. So uh, that, that, that's just one example of how we've essentially differentiated ourselves and proven that, you know, we know how to make these things. So we should be able to figure out how to start at least push over the domino for in-space manufacturing, because we do this on a daily basis. We have parts that are going up into space like every month or so, you know, um, which is which is really cool. It's like I think the most surreal thing I've ever experienced in my career was uh, making something and then watching the rocket launch with that something on it. Like I couldn't explain it. It was really weird. Like I didn't like it, <laughs> but it was cool. Um, yeah. Any any other questions so far about engineering or testing? So I, I'm actually kind of curious. I did some research on CAMI. I want to know exactly how. How does like what 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 do you guys do? Can somebody answer that for me? Like I know it's testing and validation, but so um, probably probably the simplest thing to do is start with the title of the center. Like it's the <clears throat> it's the center for advanced measurements and extreme environments, and we actually have faculty from a bunch of different focus areas that are working on different projects. So from my perspective, I work on hypersonics and. So we are developing new measurement techniques and novel diagnostics with applications to hypersonic capacity. Um, 
we have like uh, Steve Ackley, who's got a background in polar science, and actually go out on boats into the Arctic and Antarctic and make measurements of sea ice. Wow. To understand what we want. Um, Alan does all kinds of crazy volcano stuff, right? And we're a regular and <laughs> okay. a lot of fun things like cool. that. Uh, and Alberto does a lot of work on like the Gulf of Mexico atmospheric science and things like that. Uh, and then we've got affiliate faculty in different areas, like Danny Pineda does uh, work on rockets and fuels and combustion processes and propulsion. Like that. Nice. Um, so the common thread that ties us all together is everyone is measuring things in some type of situation where it's not easy to get a measurement. We're not talking about, you know, the caliper on a bench top. You need something kind of funky. Yeah. Um, and you need to be a little bit crazy if you want to make a measurement. Yeah. Close. So that's kind of what we do. And through all of it, Cami is funding graduate students and doing educational outreach and partnering with NASA with further admission. And stuff like that. Nice. So has anybody thought of working in the space industry kind of on that route? So we have a... We've got a couple of collaborations with a company called Astroport in San Antonio. Yeah. Um, where so we essentially we melt rocks is kind of the main thing we do. Yeah. Mostly for volcanoes, but but also looking at uh, additive manufacturing uh, on the moon using in situ resources, meaning right. Kaluna, Kaluna soil. Um, so yeah, we've got a couple of projects looking at looking at that. Okay. Projects. But career wise, is anybody? looking to go in this career or is it you don't really know yet maybe or what where else, what else are you guys thinking of oh, really? <laughs> where who's accepted who's not talking who is that wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nice okay where else are you guys looking like what other industries Mining, okay. Automotive. I like to make a comment. Can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. So you, I like when you said about developing tools. Yeah. And I think this applies not to knowledge. Right. When you you we are actually working on a thesis or something that I think the answer is a concrete question, but you are learning when you're in education different tools. You, right. you can think of this as Physical tools, but they could be right. programming skills or even skills, a skill set. And many of these skill sets are transferable. Mm -hmm. So whether you you know work in an engineering company in a space or even in basic research, a lot of these things like programming and data analysis, all these are transferable. So I think everybody should have a little bit of a broad kind of yeah. uh, you know like yeah. when, when you're looking for jobs. Definitely. Uh, going back to Dr. Combs said, I'm just curious, how how would any, if you guys have an idea, how would you guys, say say you had a 3D printer in space, right? How, how would you inspect that? Like, how would you make sure that that part is printed correctly? Well, it's before space, it before no, it's in space. So this is what you call space for space economy. Right now, it's mainly space for Earth. So essentially, you know, you got GPS, telecommunications, things that are serving our uses on Earth. But it's eventually, people are, will be in orbit like all the time, and there will be a lot more people. There will be a lot more people on the moon, and you can't wait to resupply them from rockets coming, yeah, coming from Earth. So essentially, you have to do what you call in situ resource utilization and use materials that are available to you wherever you are. So I'm just curious, going about what we talked about. Um, how would you inspect like grain grain structure or porosity or any kind of voids within a 3D printed part on Earth? Does anybody know that? Be in a vacuum, but what measure like what you cal what tools would you use? Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. I kind of talked about about it a little bit. Um, use a lot of ultrasonic testing and X-rays and um, fluorescent penetrant inspection. Uh, but like just just of what we know on Earth, does anybody think that that would be possible in space? How would you do that in space? Remote sensors, yeah. Um, like would you, would you just strap an X-ray machine to a rocket and a 3D printer and just say, all right, there you go? 
<laughs> oh, cool. And he started business then. <laughs> but, but it, I'm sorry. Infrared. Okay. That's another one. Now, like the reason I, I say this is because it's, it's so difficult to come up with a solution that barely works on earth, much less try it in space. Um, and what you will learn in your career, the technical part isn't even the hardest part. The hardest part is doing it from a business standpoint and achieving some sort of profitability and economic sustainment. Uh, like I mentioned before, you're, there's gonna be many times in your career where you come up with a solution for something, um, but it's not gonna solve the problem. You're gonna say, this is a cool technology. This is something that could work, but it, doesn't have a use case. So I can't stress that to you guys enough. Um, find, find a need, right? Find a need, find, find a problem and create a hypothesis around that problem. Use a scientific method and say, I think this is a solution to this problem. How am I gonna test it? Um, and then you work backwards and say, how am I gonna build it? And, and then essentially you build measure test. Uh, so, right, like, like we could just strap an x-ray machine and, and a 3D printer to a rocket and call it a day. Uh, how are you going to fund that? How are you going to get customers for that later on down the road? Who is requesting 3D printed parts in space right now? You got, what, like 10 people on the ISS, maybe? How do you create a business out of that? Exactly. So now we're in a position where the commercial space industry is just at a stagnant just stagnation, nothing's happening, right? Um, anybody wanna work at NASA? I have a lot of contacts. <laughs> okay, but uh, beside that point, I mentioned that I have asked maybe four or five different people every time I go what their role is in the commercial space industry and I get seven or eight different answers. It's not because um, they haven't thought about it, it's because they really just don't know. Uh, the commercial space industry is like the Wild West right now. Okay, <laughs> Is NASA going to be some sort of regulation like the FAA? Is it going to continue to uh, sustain the, the funding of all these, all, all these projects? How are, at what point does a commercial space company break off of that and find its own customers? Because that is the only way for sustainable industry. And there's a lot of people right now who think like it, it may not come to fruition. The commercial space industry may not happen. It may not happen for 20 years, 50 years, who knows? Because right, we have 10 people. Why would we even send it up in the first place? Why, who cares about commercial space? If I can't make money off of it, then I'm not doing it for free, right? Um, so therein lies the trick. It's not really the technical challenge. It's the business challenge behind the commercial space industry. Uh, You're more interested in the manufacturer in like on orbit? Leo, or are you thinking manufacturing things on the moon, on Mars, or just all of the above? Well, it's definitely going to be both. So, like in situ resource utilization, it'll definitely be in orbit um, using decommissioned satellites. Um, lunar lunar manufacturing will be using lunar regolith, most likely. Um, eventually, we're going to have to build things on Mars and using what's available to us on Mars. And all these are going to be different manufacturing processes, most likely. Uh, but how do you get there? Like, like why would anybody start a business in commercial space if it's so hard and if it's just like, there's just not a lot of people in it um, and you may or may not get funding. Like, is there any reason, like, any, like why, have I talked anybody out of being in the commercial space industry yet or just getting in the space industry? I'm suspecting you don't know the answer. No, nobody knows the answer. <laughs> no, nobody does. And as a business person, it's like something you have to think about all the time, right? It's like you lose a lot of sleep over it because it's like, man, you got all these cool ideas, but how are you going to fund it? Like, how do you keep that going? How do you create a business out of it? Right now, I'm just with the grants and stuff that NASA has been funded. And I guess we have a couple billionaires that's interested in it. Yeah. That's just a couple of people. So. Exactly, exactly. Um, what about Space Force? I mean, you have yeah. Space Force stuff. is a big one. Yeah. Yes. 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 So everything. You're not, you may not build a company out of it. No. Get in a ditch. Yes, everything you mentioned yeah. is old space. It's where the government funds the companies, right? It is not what they call new space. New space, that is not commercial. 
Um, and the only way an industry can really take off is when it becomes commercial and that's sustainable on its own. And NASA can go to Congress and say, hey, we need more money because we literally just created a whole industry that's sustaining itself. And they can say yes. Um, the, the reason I, the, I guess the reason I kind of ask that is, um, I, I like personally, I, I really like this industry. I think it would be cool, but there's more reasons than just like that it's cool and it's interesting, right? So it gives something, I guess an intangible, it gives something people to really look forward to. Um, I wasn't obviously fortunate to be around during, you know, the moon landing, but I can only imagine what it was like. Um, you know, you talk to people who saw that and they say it felt like the whole country was actually kind of together on the, like the whole world was like on this one thing. Um, that's something I feel like the world is kind of in desperate need of sometimes. Uh, two, there is, there's technology that, that, ha that happens in the space industry that benefit um, other industries. Yeah. So that is probably the biggest driving force. So right now what we're seeing um, and the way Land Arrow is kind of approaching this problem we're not creating a commercial space company just to create one. Um, we have a cash cow. We have our niche. We have our industry, and that's manufacturing. And it is like many, many, many billions of dollars big. Okay, so we have a lot of work we can do in that. But we're saying, well, the way to commercialize space is going to be by taking existing business processes and ex existing companies and essentially creating its own like branch, if you will. Um, so if you're a company that's like, you know, sells real estate or something. It's like, okay, well, commercial space industry is coming up. How can we business develop, you know, develop that business? And it's just going to be a separate arm of within the same company. I personally, I think like to answer your question, no, I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody does, but I think if there is one viable way to actually commercialize space, it's by establishing an existing company with a cash cow foundation terrestrial market and kind of branching out into eventually bringing contracts and um, things like that. I don't know, does anybody else have any ideas? I, I got nothing, so. <laughs> You're asking me those stuff again, which. Yeah, that's, yeah, because, because, that's know, exactly what it is. Because you know, this, is, this is the, you know, the tension between basic research and applied research, right? Yep. And so we need both. Right. You know, because uh, uh, many times, you know, you know, the high risk, high reward kind of ideas are out there, but it takes one of those to develop a thriving world possibility. Yeah. So it's good to have, I think, a broad uh, portfolio be investing in both. So like you're saying, you have a company that is established at the market, branch out into the venture at high risk, but who knows, maybe they create a new industry sub industry into space and so that yes. that kind of boom. And all that works well when you don't have payroll to make. When you have payroll, then it's like, well, we have to figure something out, you know? So, um, but yeah, no, I mean, is there like, I, I guess just going to you guys, is there anything like you guys want to know in particular about the industry or about companies in the industry or about how maybe your degree or your background or your interest can kind of find a way into the industry? Well, I know that a lot of the earth sciences maybe have a lot of research here on Earth. And I know in my degree, I want to go into mining and hydrogeology, but I know that it's analog to a lot of what's found on lunar and Mars surfaces. Mm -hmm. So learning a lot about the science of the earth and also being able to correlate that with um, uh, with the um, astronomy and different uh, planetary sciences yeah. is a possibility. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, at least that's where my mind was like that. Um, yeah. And so me being able to dig into uh, an actual earth mining site and understanding the workings of how that works gives me knowledge and experience about, you know, if I do want to transfer those knowledge, like you had mentioned, the transfer of mm -hmm. information and knowledge and experience is transferable yeah. towards the um, towards the planetary science portion yeah. of it. And that's kind of how I see my, my future going. Yeah. Um, but not straight into the right. um, astro world yeah. of that sort, but kind of getting knowledge of that and being able to transfer it. So you're kind of taking a similar approach that a lot of businesses do, right? Like you, you're saying, well, there's an existing need here on Earth, and eventually maybe I can start working my way into space. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, or contributing somewhere. Yeah, or contributing. Yeah. The knowledge of that. I think that's going to be very, I guess, helpful. Yeah. What made you want to get into mining? Um, I do follow along with the economic uh, commodities that are happening in the world, and, and part of geosciences is not just about 
sustainability and environmental sustainability. It's about both. It's about uh, economic progress and development that our future of the world's going into. So in mining, especially in rare earths and critical mining and those different metals that are used every day, that's not going away. Yeah. And um, the idea of like being able to work with development and maybe doing it in a way that can be economic as well as environmental sustainable um, methods, if you have that type of knowledge going alongside of it, then maybe that methodology can be applied towards new science that's going to be in the planetary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are good reasons. Do you think ever mining could be environmentally sustainable? Um, or is it intrinsically just not? <laughs> those are great questions. It depends on what you're mining, right? Uh, and and also um, the location of it, uh, and how, how impactful is it on the community surrounding it? Yeah. Um, and then what do you do with the resources? Back in the day, no, it wasn't environmentally sustainable. But we have resources now, like uh, we can actually go back to old mining sites when they're doing reclamation events and you can go to the tailings and we didn't have the type of manufacturer ability back then to actually yeah. utilize all of the, um, I guess, take out all of the resources from the rock that we can today. So actually a lot of the tailings, which are a lot of contaminants and pollutions that people don't really do, they just cover it up. Yeah. Um, we can go back to that and like source more from there that we couldn't before because of the technologies that we have today. Right. So yeah, there is absolutely the ability to make it more environmentally safe, but the the I think the idea is like how can we make it environmentally safe to just the population that's nearby it? Like what kind yeah. of damage is it? Yeah. The community that's near. And I think that's what the, the problem is. With the United States wanting to kind of put same, not sanctions on ourselves. I feel like that's what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, the progression of mining in the United States, and that we do have our resources available. Yeah. Does anybody have any interest in material science, which is kind of similar to what you're doing? But any, like anybody interested in materials at all? I definitely, rec I definitely recommend it. If nobody is absolutely thinking about it, I 100% recommend it. Uh, as I mentioned before, materials is like, one of the most important things you can have in any sort of engineering and manufacturing because without it it's whatever you design is just simply a nice little picture on your computer screen if you can't validate and test and repeatedly get the same results using these materials uh, then you have no manufacturing industry that's and, a good point because i've always said no matter what you're doing in engineering yeah comes yeah materials. he was my senior design professor by the way for anybody who didn't yeah. know him <laughs> Do you still do senior design here or no? What's that? Do you still do teach senior uh, design or I'm no? Five, five, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, Professor Johnson has a lot of great um, um, experience that you can draw upon, especially with like the real world scenario. Uh, I think the <laughs> biggest shock that I got when I graduated was just how different engineering in the real world is. Uh, you're not, you don't have to do, and I'm sure this applies across disciplines. You don't have to just do thermodynamics. You're not going to be pumping out heat transfer equations, right? It, everything you do will probably be revolving around like profitability or doing things under budget or on time. Um, yeah, yeah. So like you talked a lot about business. Yeah. I, 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 you know, but you, you, you were an engineer, right? Yes. Yeah. So could you tell us, share a little bit how did you acquire the business skills after you graduated? Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. I think. The, of, of, of all the skills I got during college, the business skills were absolutely uh, the best for my career, for just doing well. Um, but to your point, I needed the engineering background to do it. So what do I mean by that? Business is just like problem solving on steroids. Engineering for me and a lot of other STEM uh, related disciplines too is problem solving. So one ties really well to the other if you can apply it. So uh, back, so I just like back to my college days, um, I, I didn't like, I, like I said, I was an engineer. I, you know, we're not all the same, but a lot of them are, a lot of us are more um, introverted and we don't like talking, but talking and being extroverted is the best thing you can do for your career. So at some point in my collegiate career, I had a crazy friend who like kept wanting to start a fraternity and he like kept asking me, asking me, I was like, fine, I finally did it, right? So for whatever reason, I got actually like voted to be the social chair in my fraternity. And I will say that is definitely one of the best experiences I had because that allowed me to actually go out and talk to people and do all these things. 
that is where I think my business like acumen really started. So how can you apply that? Go out and talk to people, learn how to be extroverted, network with people, um, take every opportunity you can to ask questions. Um, but the second experience, uh, the second of two biggest experiences where I learned business was actually having payroll to make, uh, having overhead, having rent. Everything becomes very real when you have those things. And there's no motivation like having to make money to literally sustain people. So um, that was the biggest thing. You learn very fast when if things do work and don't work. So the companies that do end up succeeding, it's not because they have good ideas. It's because they can iterate the fastest. Um, they figure out, they fail, and they test quickly and cheaply. Those businesses succeed, which is why sometimes you're like, how does that business make any money? Like, it's such a stupid idea. Well, it's because they know what they're doing. They test, they build, they design, they measure. Um, yeah, so that's, I like, I, I kind of, bring in engineering and business together a lot just because of how similar they are, but people don't really see the similarities. Um, I think a lot of engineers can see the sim similarities between the two. If you have the opportunity to actually do both of them, I absolutely recommend it. Whether it's a managerial, managerial position, uh, starting a little side hustle or something, you learn a lot. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you do anything with things that are metal? Yeah, uh, we actually do some 3D printing. So like, I really do want 3D printing to work out eventually because it'd be really cool. We're not a machining company, we're a manufacturing company, whatever manufacturing is, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so yeah, we've done a lot of 3D printing with uh, plastic. The craziest things we've done, uh, I definitely recommend you looking it up if you want to learn more about materials, is a material called Vespol. Um, so we've machined a lot of like PTFE, ABS, like just random stuff, you know, like that. Uh, but Vespol is by far the craziest material. And the reason I asked about materials is, again, because each one has so many different properties and use cases. So Vespol is this crazy plastic that we had to machine one time for a company in Houston uh, that so happens to have good properties, uh, lubricating properties, and it also doesn't outgas in a vacuum, which lends itself well to space. Vespol is one of those that we had to machine and like you hold it and it's like $200 an inch of like just a tiny little round piece. Um, and we are like, I don't, you know, don't, never machined it before, but um, we did that. Yeah, we do quite a bit with plastics. Um, you spell that? Uh, V-E-S-P-E-L. Yeah. yeah. What do you do with your, uh, the waste? Like, do you, are you able to- So- uh, that's a client send you the materials to yeah. work with, and then you build manufacturing to be able to build out of that. So, what type of waste do you see from that, and are you able to reutilize that waste, or is that something you that's, have to? Put that one in that's a good question. So, that's another place where additive manufacturing has an advantage over CNC. You use exactly what you need. Um, additive, or sorry, subtractive is where you take away material from the raw piece of material. So, we actually buy our own material and source our own stuff. Um, in manufacturing, this is why it is so important for processes and materials to be standardized. I can get 100 different drawings from 100 different companies, and I know how to make every single one of them. Okay, why is that? It's because we standardize on materials. We standardize on processes. I know that if these guys ask for 6061, T651, that's going to be the same 6061, T651 this guy asked for. Or this guy asked for 7075, or this one asked for 7050. I know where I can get all these things, and everybody's expecting the same thing. It's because it's standardized. So going back to what we do with the waste, um, essentially what we do is every, like these subtractive machines create chips, right? So like everything that's not your part becomes these like little chips, um, and we essentially like recycle them. So we take them to like a recycling place, or the people pick them up, and then just like circle of life just kind of like melts it back down, turns it into more aluminum or whatever and reuses it. So there is a lot of recyclability in subtractive manufacturing. I, I think people don't um, give enough credit to that. Uh, another thing about additive. So we talked about additive and subtractive. Additive, I think in my opinion, 3D printing will be more of a replacement for casting and forgings than it will be for CNC machining. People like, I, I don't think, 3D printing has essentially evolved into its potential because people are comparing it to something it's not. 
it will never replace CNC machining. And I can't wait to watch this video in 20 years and see how wrong I was, but um, uh, it's, it's probably not gonna replace it, right? But it could replace a lot of things for castings and forgings, which have very similar manufacturing processes and testing processes, which go back to the non-destructive testing that we talked about. Um, FPI, F, um, ultrasonic testing, mag particle, things like that. Yeah, I can go on and on about materials. It's extremely like it's fascinating. Like, these source all your materials. Do you just kind of like, trust them on their word for this composition? Or no, and that's testing? so every single material that we get. That's why it's standardized. So we actually get material test reports with every single piece of material that we get. So we know the composition of each chemical like element that's in there essentially. We know the density, we know hardness, we know all these things. Um, so yeah, you have to have certs for everything. And that's where Stardust comes in. Yeah. Stardust actually manages our entire process and manages all those certs. So that way it just kind of does everything on its own. Uh, from experience that we have when we get sealants from different sources, like mm -hmm. we also think are legitimate have certificates, yeah. but we do actually have the capability and do some of our own diligence just because of our own research. Yeah. Um, shows that it's different you know, yeah. multiple times, actually. I think the five samples that I had used in my research did not come up with the same percentages wow. <laughs> of purity levels. And wow. there's a big difference in the way that we heated it up and changed it and the way the crystallization of the structure of the mineral changed over time yeah. in temperature. It made a big difference. Yeah, it did. Um, changed its composition. So yep. um, we learned a lot of things from that. We learned also not to trust the company, mm -hmm. but um, that that it, that insight gives you that. But the standardization is also, I would say, absolutely useful. Did you attend the AST meeting that was here in San Antonio for that? No, no, I didn't. But uh, a lot of the material like specs that you'll read are AST, a ASME dash or ASTM dash or SAE dash. Those are all those organizations that basically come together and standardize on these yeah. things. So uh, there's actually a lot of stories where people like go to jail for using the wrong material. They say they use this material and it's, it's not. Um, so yeah, people actually do go to jail for that. And it's like a very bad, like, yeah, like grit. Grit in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Service, but it was it was, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's why we keep track of all those things, and that's what Stardust does. It's kind of like it's our moat around our castle. Um, does anybody have any experience with three D printing? Yeah, you do. Anybody else? Like, I know you guys have three. Come on, you're, you're, we're all nerds here. It's fine. Just, just tell me. You got a three D printer in your room? That's fine. Yeah. Um, have you? Metal three D printing in your room? No, we don't do any metal three D printing. Yeah. We only do subtractive from metal. Um, but the reason I ask is because the next time you 3D print something, test different materials, try different vendors or try different makers and see what different properties you get and actually test the properties. So don't just say, oh, that looks nice. It's a cool little model figure of I don't know, some Smash Bros character. Actually like put it to some like tensile strength test and tell me if you get the same print material structures from print to print. Therein lies your problem with additive manufacturing in space. One of my things I do to sort of drive that point home is I have um, folks uh, manufacture nine cubes, yeah, five process. You know, it's like one millimeter by one millimeter by one. I'm bigger than that. Yeah, uh, ten by ten by ten or something. It's different every and, time, and right? Then, and then stack them together. Yeah, and make the measurement and see if you come out. Right. From yeah. the dimension. Yeah. And do that from process to process. Yes. And you will never get the facts. Right, <laughs> right. Um, we're about out of time here, but um, I don't know if we want to, like, if you guys have any more questions or um, I don't know what you want to do next. But essentially, I guess what, what I will say to start, like, wrapping up, um, just it, if, if you guys, and just aside from this, if you guys have an interest in being in the space industry, um, maybe you can make my email, like let him have my email or something, but maybe I can put you in contact with somebody I know. Um, I know chief engineers, vice presidents, general managers, C-suite people at like a lot of companies, like I'm not going to name them, but you know them. Uh, so if I can help put roadrunners in jobs, that'd be great. 
or yes. Did you mention the internship yet? Yes, I'm getting to that. Thank you. So um, for the mechanical engineers out there too, if you know somebody or if you are one, we're offering two internships. Um, all of our interns have, I think 100% of our interns have been placed in jobs after they graduate. So we have a very good track record. One is at Boeing, one's at Amazon, one is at NanoRacks, one is at General Motors, one is at Tesla. Uh, I can go on and on, but um, yeah. And that goes to show if you have manufacturing experience, you will almost certainly rise to the above, like rise to the top of that resume packet. Um, but, but yeah, and if you have any questions too, like feel free to email me or like how, like if, if you have any questions about companies that like you just don't know about or any opportunities and just say, hey, I don't know what I wanna do in this career, but I know I wanna be in this industry or whatever, let me know. I may not have the answer for you, but I may be able to get you to somebody who does have the answer. Um, and the last thing I will is, is say this. Uh, if you haven't noticed already, uh, like I, I have a lot of like business background and that has taken me, I can tell you from experience, that has taken me the like further than just about any other skill set I have. So I definitely recommend you doing that, whether you're starting your own thing or whether you're just in your career. Have a business background and a tool set where you understand business processes. Um, uh, let's see, something else. Oh yeah, so next two. For everybody in STEM that's looking to kind of do research or something else, I challenge you to design your experiment or whatever it is you're trying to test systematically. It's really easy, especially for me like as an engineer to just like start jumping into something and just trying to create solutions for something that is like not even a problem. Systematically go through like your scientific method and say, what's the problem? What am I trying to test? How am I gonna test that? And then actually build a thing and iterate. You're gonna get to your problem not by having good ideas, but by being able to iterate faster than the next guy. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. If you wanna check out our, our, our company website, it's landero.com, L-A-N-D-A-E-R-O. Uh, we do manufacturing, as I mentioned, and we're also starting our engineering side. So hopefully I can actually give a lot more internships that aren't just mechanical engineering, but more science related too. So yeah, thanks for having me.